what I'm talking about. Wait. Okay, now, from the beginning. All right, we're here this morning to uh, talk about round tripping DCC tools with uh, Autodesk. We've got an exclusive partnership with Autodesk, um, and we announced at Unite Austin last year. Um, and I'll uh, cover some of the some of the enhancements that we've been working on, some of the things they've been working on, and then give you some examples of some of the projects that we've been working on. So my name is Mike Weatherick. I'm a producer with the Made with Unity team. Um, there's my Twitter if you want to ping me later on. Um, we work really closely with uh, the Montreal feature teams, of which the DCC team, animation team, timeline team, audio video, they're all based out of Montreal, so we work really closely with them. Um, and their, their main mission, the DCC group, is to basically allow people to round trip geometry using artist friendly interfaces, merge your changes back in, non-destructive non workflows, and then we've been working really closely with the Autodesk group who are literally actually one building away from our office in Unity, at Unity in Montreal, so it makes the collaboration really easily, um, really easy. So today I'll cover a couple topics, um, go through a few things. Um, we'll start off with just the scripted importers and some of the things we've been doing under the hood, um, and then we'll go through some of the, uh, the workflows. So scripted importers is actually the foundation of a lot of what the DCC team does. The, and originally, the FBX SDK was, it was all in C++ black box land. You couldn't modify it. You couldn't really do anything with it. Um, we added asset pre and post processors at, um, a couple versions ago, but it really still didn't let, give you the, the control that you needed. Um, so the whole goal with the scripted importers is allow you to basically tag any file type and then create your own import pipeline based on that file type. So this, is, uh, this gives you a completely or a super powerful way of uh, manipulating content coming into Unity. So our FBX SDK integration is now moving into C Sharp user land. Same thing with Alembic or USD or some of the other file formats. And you can, there's, there's examples in the, come on in. There's examples in the, uh, the manual of how to sort of get started with that. Um, but that literally is how our FBX and our Alembic and all the other file formats that we're working on um, are being handled going forward. The other big feature that they added is presets. Presets is actually super powerful. Um, it's kind of hidden because it's literally just this, this button in the corner, there's one button in the corner of the inspector. Um, but what this actually allows you to do is define basically a set of workflows or imports for presets for loading content into the engine. So you can use this to batch process FBXs. It's similar to writing a post or an asset processor script, except it, it has a UI, it has an interface. Um, so anytime you've ever had to go through and manually adjust like import settings, I don't want cameras or I don't want lights or I want it to be this specific setting, you can actually create a preset now and then click this set as default preset and every, every model of that file type gets loaded. They also allow you to you can drag them into scenes to create content. You can set up lights presets and apply it to a light or um, how you want to load in an animations. Um, we just recently did a big mo motion capture shoot and I had to process like a couple hundred animations. You can create one preset and then apply it to that whole batch um, and it's massive work workflow improvement. Um, and then obviously the FBX importer itself. So we already provide support for a lot of stuff. Um, we've been expanding this. Uh, we added P Stingray PBS support, so you can actually do your look dev in, in the Autodesk suite, um, and then basically get your uh, PBR, PBS shaders back and forth. Um, we've added cameras, animated custom properties, and um, a number, uh, basically just general improvements and bug fixes um, to, the, to the import side. It's already built into Unity. You don't need to do anything, obviously. It's kind of one of, been, always been one of Unity's strong points, the fact that we can load in FBX content out of the box, but we've been doing quite a bit of work to improve that. And recently in uh, .2, we actually added an exporter now, so you can actually export content out of Unity. Um, and it works on all these different platforms. It's available today from the asset store. Um, and we've been expanding it. And uh, I've got a quick, quick video. This is the, the very first release video that we've played. If it works. Why is my video not going to play? Well, that's going to be. Why? Why are you not playing? Well, this is going to be from current slide. I can see you. All right, we'll skip that. 
it's up on the asset store. I'm going to try and figure out why videos aren't working, but it's a bit freely available and it actually allows you to, again, it has a, uh, a very lightweight plug-in on the Maya or Mac side, but it allows you to round trip. So it basically makes the Autodesk tools aware of your Unity project, where, the, where your assets folder is, and lets you actually round trip really easily. And we've been doing quite a bit of work on it. So the exporter already pr currently provides support for your just hierarchies, your meshes, materials, textures, cameras. Um, so you can actually set up camera paths in Unity, export them out, set up obviously your objects. And this becomes really powerful when you're working with the, the new world building tools. For example, the Pro Builder that's now built into 2018-1. You can do all your gray boxing and then very quickly bring it back or bring it out to um, Maya, Max, whatever, and then up res it or do whatever you need to for your final content. Um, I've been using Pro Builder for quite a few years, but this is like a huge um, time saver because normally you'd have to set it up in Unity and then kind of reproduce it in another program. Being able to actually just send it back out and back um, is, a, is a huge thing. Um, hey, look, this one actually showed up. Let's see if this plays. Why are none of my videos playing? Well, this was going to show you an update on what's coming out, which is the new um, so timeline integration. So we can actually, uh, when you set up your object, you can actually export, oh, come on in. You can export animations right from timeline. Um, so this is really useful for uh, gray boxing out gameplay ideas or cinematics or whatever it is. And the, the, the great thing about this is working with the gray boxing tools or modeling tools in Unity like Pro Builder, you can, before your artists even start creating content, you can actually start roughing out ideas and then sending them, sending them over, the, over to the artist to, uh, to start iterating on. Um, this all, the F, Exporter also works really well with the, the recorder tool. Um, we showed off the recorder, we've talked about the recorder a couple of times. It's also on the asset store right now. Um, but it, uh, the recorder traditionally, like, or the original intent was just to output frames. Um, but it also records anything in Unity. So you can actually set it up to record gameplay sequences or um, you wanted to have a replay or just play out a sequence, have a, like a, may I say a gamepad controller, have a character run around, you can actually record those sequences and bring it back into Unity. In fact, that's actually so cool, I wanna show the video, so I'm gonna try and see if it runs straight, straight from my machine. It is. What's new in 60 seconds? Let's try this. Of course, that's not gonna play. I'm gonna do this. Right now, this one. Let's go back to a single screen and see if this works any better. Current slide. Are you gonna play now? No. Don't use presenter view. Go. Yeah, there we go. All right, so I don't need the audio. Okay. So this one, again, you can start getting complete cutscenes, bring them out, have gameplay characters run around, load it out into Maya or Max, um, and then fine tune it. So you can actually do your, your rough blocking of animations um, and then get the animation right into, right into the DCC tools. Um, this completely changes the workflow of how you're building cinematics and um, especially tied into say the Cinemachine storyboard feature that Adam was showing earlier this week. You can actually create your concept art, overlay it over top your gray box, your blocking, bring it into the, the DCC tools, enhance it, do your proper animation, and then bring it back in and get the, the end result. Um, or make trailers or whatever you're gonna do. Um, when you say hierarchy export, does that include skinning? Yes, you can do skinning, you can do weighting. Um, it'll, uh, so this is sort of what's coming in the next version. So uh, yeah, so you can round trip um, and export animated characters. So you can, and I'll show you an example of that in a bit. Um, but uh, yeah, so lights, you can set up your lights in Unity, send it back, you can do cameras. It does most of the camera properties. We've got a, an experimental forum, there's a beta forum. You can actually, there's a ongoing discussions with it. Um, you just find it up top there later this year, and this is where the, the Autodesk partnership is really starting to pay off, is being able to do um, constraint matching. So we're working with them on their 
their actual implementation of how constraints are being handled in Motion Builder or Maya. So we can actually, we're not reverse engineering these things. We're actually working with them to make sure they come across identically. So this is a huge thing for um, obviously doing like more precise animation. And then blend shapes is actually really cool. And we're actually going to be able to bring in round trip blend shapes as well. Sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I know the way constraints work, it depends a lot on the sub-matrices that are involved in Unity's yes. transform is TRS, translate vertically scale, that's it. Yeah. Maya's transform structure for joint is like translate, scale inverse, joint orient, rotation, uh, scale orient, and then scale. Yeah. So are you at least going to incorporate like the possibility of having an optimal joint orient because that makes such a difference? I'd have to forward that off to the DCC guys, but I know that's exactly why what, what we're working with Autodesk is to make sure that they come across one for one. Um, and it, uh, yeah, it's gonna, it completely changes how you, how you can bring in animated content for sure. I love it. I love yeah. It. yeah. <coughs> Sorry, but if you get, a, get, we'll swap cards at the end and then I can uh, put you in touch with the leads. So yeah, so for light, lights and cameras, being able to bring across your, your light types, animated properties, camera parameters, being able to actually set up your field of view and projection types, focal lengths, um, near far planes. Um, and this is uh, obviously Adam Myhill, our head of cinematic, he's, he's very passionate about this particular piece um, and extending that into physical camera support to the point where we can, you can say I'm a director, I'm using this kind of camera with this kind of lens and being able to actually bring them back and forth because um, game engines and you, like, treat things like field of view very different than a film camera does. I think we have vertical field of view, there's is horizontal, there's all kinds of strangeness. So Adam's been working with uh, the DCC team to basically make sure that these things behave like a camera operator would expect them to behave. So animation, so this is a huge one here. Um, again, being able to record animation, so I, I mentioned timeline, I showed that off in the keynote. Um, but recorder as well is another piece. So it's, uh, it gives you an interface in Unity where you can actually say, I want to record this, tra this, this object and its hierarchy, um, and it'll output animation keys. You can, there's also an API for it. It's called the Game Object Recorder. Um, if you look in the, the manual, you can actually just tell it, I want to record this component from this root object, and it'll record all. So for example, transforms. You can record the transforms from uh, a parent node and it'll just output it all as just an anim file that you can then take and export out. Um, and then obviously things like physics, you want to do a physics simulation, record it all out and then bake it essentially so you can have like a, a building crumble and kind of in Unity and then export it out, round trip it. You're actually saying that you can record the joint animation of someone playing a character? Yes, absolutely. That's that's the whole point, yeah, that's with Recorder, yeah, it's awesome. So you, you could use that, um, then the API is actually, it's available at runtime as well. So you could potentially do runtime replays or um, setting up, again, making game traders. You could have people playing games and then actually take that sequence out into Maya. And I've, we've got examples also, I've got a video of, of doing that exact thing. Um, and it's, uh, it's super cool. And when you tie in all of the runtime physics and interactions and all the other things that are um, what makes games interesting, being able to actually bake that, capture it out, and then and then say polish it up or render it, uh, render a trailer out of it, it's uh, it's opening up a whole new level of possibility. No way. So you can like render this whole thing software in Arnold and Maya. Yeah, or you, yeah, you could take the whole thing out, take your whole scene sequence, whatever, and. As, uh, as, as FBX into Maya, and then yeah, render it with it, whatever. Yeah, and it'll just bake it down into transforms, essentially. And um, I've, got the exact, I've got an example of doing that, and then also the same thing, using the other cool part of it is being able to use the, the physics simulation side of the Autodesk products um, to be able to do some of the complex, say, fracturing and destruction, and then bringing that into Unity as interactions that get triggered on timeline. Um, so it's kind of it, it, it's super powerful in both directions. So, um, That's awesome. and then node name remapping. So this is obviously a big one. So it's basically trying to make sure that the assets you load out match when they come back in. Sometimes, like the artist might rename things. We can actually try and figure out um, how to how to remap them so you aren't losing things like Unity components and 
um, other properties. And then of course, everything, everything that we're doing here is available through APIs as well, so you can script and enhance it yourself. So this is a quick video showing off um, some of the stuff that we talked about. So here, the, one of the artists at, my, at, at the Autodesk side started literally with a sphere um, and is showing off some of the new awesome uh, mud box sculpting features. So here we go, literally from a sphere all the way to Unity or through Maya, rigging, doing quick rig, exporting it out to Unity, capturing some animation in Unity, bringing it back into Maya and retune it. This video is about five minutes long, but it was on, it's good enough that I want to show sort of the whole process. Um, and Mudbox new sculpting features are, are it's amazing. So being able to go super quick through the whole process to create um, a, an awesome looking zombie. Things like topologizing your high res meshes. This is always a challenge and it's always, they're typically very time consuming, but some of the new tools that they've got for basically auto topologizing and then the, the, the quad tools that they have, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's completely changing the workflows, so. So here and then now they're into the Maya and just being able to, to quickly map it to your, the quad with quad draw, it's uh, again, so, so much faster than doing this manually. Uh, in the model importer, you can actually specify whether you want it to be quads. Um, so yeah, w w it eventually it will be triangulated under, under the hood. Um, but uh, on the import and export, we, I think we try to retain that structure as well. Uh, so the import is quad, so you preserve it, and then you export it. Will it preserve the quads on the export? I believe so, yes. I don't know. Okay. Ons, I can't, I can't remember. I haven't actually confirmed that, but I believe, I believe it tries to. Ons is the product manager for the DCC. Yeah. 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 So some of the uh, the new uh, layout U UV layout tools again. This is nobody likes doing UV layouts. It's very time consuming. It's painful. So they've done some some awesome work, um, being able to actually set up um, nice UV layouts. The PBS shader. Um, this is really important for doing look dev. So you can actually do your look dev in the DCC tools, and we can actually map the shaders across. Um, and then obviously you want to be able to rig it and lay it out. So they've got uh, the, the quick rig that they ex use in this example here. Um, and obviously Maya is kind of the industry standard for doing rigging um, and being able to make sure that these tools work really well with the, the Unity side is a uh, we're doing quite a bit of work, and this is where the constraints and some of the other things that we're, we're, we're working to enhance come in. I love where this is going. Yeah. No, I'm just basically trying to identify all the pain points, essentially, that are sort of in the process um, on both Autodesk and Unity side, and then trying to improve and streamline these workflows. So, um, so just after the rigging here, then we start getting into Unity and then being able to manipulate the animations in Unity and bring it back. Um, I can talk to you guys about adding one more stub matrix. It would make a huge difference. And I can tell you exactly where to go in the... Cool. Uh, we'll definitely have to get you in touch with, uh, with Mark, our, our DCC lead, who's, uh, both, and also just on the animation as well. So. Um, but being able to again retarget mocap um, both on the Autodesk side and then in the Unity side, it's it's allows you to really quickly create um, get content essentially up and running with almost in almost no time. So um, Yeah, yeah, no, it, uh, it's trying to do things like game trailers or things like that afterwards or, or even high-res high, high res marketing trailers um, for your game. It's always been super, super painful, so. Um, Can you specify on the export to try to get it as close to 24 FPS as possible? Um, with the, in timeline, you can, um, you can set your, you, when you're keyframing in timeline, you specify it. 
um, on export when you, I can't remember if you set a frame um, or if it's just our internal game clock or time clock. Um, I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah, because internally, internally we use a, just a high precision counter, and then in timeline, it's just basically a UI that basically shows you the different imp, uh, the different uh, frames. But again, here's the the animation coming into Unity, um, being able to actually quickly set up a, a controller, being able to actually modify it, and then re-export it back out to tweak it um, and adjust it. So. Um, Being able to so the, the linked prefab is basically where it, it creates the the connection. So when you bring back content back in, um, you do the import. It knows about your project, and then you can bring it in, see the animation. So this is an animation exported out of Unity back into Maya, um, and then you can adjust it, clean it up, um, yeah, do whatever you want to the the actual animation curves and then bring that back in. So you want to add some hero movements or hero poses or um, what, however it is, bring it back into Unity and Unity it just, and the important part with this is if you have other components, say you've set up uh, the char all your character scripts or colliders or ragdoll, whatever it is, it keeps that. That's the, that's the big one. You aren't having to rebuild your, rebuild your components or rebuild your prefabs. Um, it, it, keeps that connection, which again, I've had, I've worked on many projects with Unity and you have to rebuild your gameplay character, or you rebuild your prefab over and over. Have, being able to do this round tripping and save that information is just massive time saving. Um, and then going into layers and all the other fun that goes in there, being able to mask animation with timeline and, and on the Maya side, um, it becomes, again, just even more and more powerful, so. Cool. I'll uh, I'll have to chase that down, but uh, I, I, again, I know we I know we did work to make sure that we're loading and pres preserving it on import. I just haven't tr checked or tried it myself um, on on export, so I'll have to uh, I'll have to confirm that. But let's jump to the next one. So um, so this is uh, an example that we showed at the keynote. But here um, again, we had the characters with mocap animation. They're kind of doing their thing. And what we wanted to do was basically add interactions. So we're using ProBuilder to rough out objects, being able to gray box objects. And this object's animated in timeline. Um, so I exported it out. Um, this is in Max this time. So the, the vehicle simulation, again, Max is really good at, at, at simulation. So being able to bring it in. They did destruction as well. So being able to actually do this kind of crazy high detail fracturing and destruction, bring it in, bring it back in drop it right into the exact same spot and, I, and it, I didn't have to reposition it, it was exactly where the gameplay was and then being able to play it back and get the performance on device, it was, uh, it was yeah, the fact that it worked first time, I was, I was really blown away but it's actually that cool, it's really killer. Um, so, um, it, so I just wanted to show some other projects that we've worked on that use the Autodesk tools as well. So this is actually from uh, some slides from the, uh, the Atom 2 and 3 projects. So uh, the Made with Unity team was fortunate enough to work with Oats on these projects. Um, so here, again, this is kind of going the, the different side with photogrammetry. Um, you saw the Book of the Dead. We've talked about photogrammetry quite a bit over, the, over GDC as well. Um, and this is a very different type of content creation. It's going through photos being able to actually generate assets from thousands of photos um, and being able to bring it in. So going from literally photographs to the content in Unity um, and getting insane fidelity, it's, uh, it's, it, was, it was amazing. Um, and again, they approached this as, as they would a traditional film. Um, they went location scouting, they found the actual environment, they went down there, they hired a drone team to do the coverage took thousands of photos and then brought it into Unity and got, got the, the amazing results you see in, uh, in, the, sh in the shoots. 
Um, for a secondary shot, this is the right behind their office. They hired or fo phoned up a, a local prop company and set up this this little stage um, to basically do secondary mocap. And then they captured a bunch of the smaller prop objects. Um, again, very quick, being able to turn around assets in, in a matter of hours or a day, um, whereas it, the modeling and all the texturing detail um, goes, it just takes so long. And then getting the, the, the gorgeous results you see in engine, um, it's, yeah, it was just a huge time saving. With the team size they had and the, and the schedule we had, we wouldn't have been able to produce as many assets as we needed. So. And there's one shot in particular where there was a massive garbage pile. Imagine trying to model something like this from scratch. So they actually phoned up a recycling company in Vancouver, said, hey, can we come out and just dump a pile of garbage on the floor, buy a couple pizzas, and we're just going to take a bunch of photos. And they're, they're like, you guys are weird. <laughs> but then they let, they let them do it. And they grabbed uh, their photos. And again, each one of these dots is where they took photos from, did the scan, got the high-res sculpt, and then you get it in into Unity, <coughs> um, and it's uh, it's amazing. And they use the delighting tool um, specifically for the, all the secondary shots and the uh, the garbage the pile. Um, but this and the white paper we were talking about that before the white paper on photogrammetry that um, a couple of the guys at Unity Labs wrote. Uh, it's it's awesome. It's it's so in detail. Um, and we, we use it internally to kind of learn more about how to, how to make great looking content. And again, these are free. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's, it's really cool. Um, again, I'm still learning more about how to get good results out of photogrammetry, but the, the awesome thing is you can do it with your phone. You can, like anybody can create these gorgeous, gorgeous assets. Most of the tools they used are actually free as well. Um, Here's a video from uh, SIGGRAPH this last year. There's a, I, I can't g click the link, but that's, there's the link up top. Although that's Matthew Mueller's link, so it's link pointing to the French site. Um, the next big thing that we did for the Atom 2 and 3 project was Alembic. Um, Sean Lowe, um, member of our team, he's been talking about that at a couple other sessions, but um, Alembic has a, a, we've been working on Alembic integration in Unity for a few years. Um, the Marza project was the, one of the first ones. Um, let's see, oh, it's gonna, is it gonna link to the right spot? Let me find the right spot here. So this is an animation project by a studio in Japan called Marza, and uh, one of our engineers at Unity Japan um, created the Alembic process specifically for this shot here. Um, and you'll see, it's basically about this little girl who's got a gift for her parents and her toy, whatever that is, is trying to help not lose it. Um, but uh, because they're a traditional film TV, a TV animation studio, they wanted to push the limit to an insane level. Um, and you'll see in this shot here, it's crazy what they were able to do. And this is rendered real time in Unity. Um, they call it the Marza Movie Pipeline, but this is actually part of, it's a free plugin that's available now. Um, it's on GitHub and I'll talk about sort of the, the, the roadmap for that. Um, let me just jump forward a touch. Oh, I guess we're almost there. I just love this shot because it's just insane. Um, and every one of these balls they simulated in whatever, whatever they simulated it in and being able to actually play it back as a, as a massive vertex cache in Unity. Like, I don't know how many billions of polygons that is, but it's, uh, it's insane. Um, so that was sort of our first, first um, use case for the Alembic stuff. Um, and then uh, the original Atom projects used it as well for some of the cloth tearing. Um, and I think these are little mini videos that should play in theory. Go, except my computer's being slow. Um, so when he tears, tears the, the cloth in the original Atom, that was also done with Alembic as well. And then for two and three, we, uh, this is the oats pipeline here. So we used Marvelous Designer for cloth. We did facial capture, which was actually done as a, kind of like old school vertex capture. Where they capture the faces at 60 frames or 30 frames a second, and then bake it out, bring it through Maya, and then output it through one of these formats. Um, and then the motion capture was just a traditional mocap mo skeleton. That w and then we had to somehow ma make it all match and fit, which was the fun part. Um, but it, all that composition was done in Unity. 
So this is their traditional pipeline. So they use Shotgun, again, another Autodesk product that we've been working with uh, the team to help integrate um, for editorial. They did all the characters and they do the normal sim and then they're rendering out there um, using whatever render it is. When they moved to Unity, it basically created all of this stuff that's traditionally done in various levels of offline or post and all the other things. It's all done in the engine. Um, and they're bringing out, so these are the main file formats that they're bringing thing out through. So you got your Alembic caches and then uh, obviously the FBX format. And that was the only real change is they just had to export stuff through FBX instead of just saving it in Maya. Um, we used it for clothing, facial animation, some background props. And during the project, we worked with the, uh, the DCC team to add better, uh, timeline integration. So you can drag Alembic clips onto timeline. Um, vertex sharing, which was actually an, an interesting one because uh, Alembic is just a point cache. It doesn't actually know about each frame. It's assuming like that, the crazy wave of, of whatever that geometry was. The, the, the geometry or the topology of the mess changes from frame to frame. Um, for doing a facial animation, we actually had a constant topology and we wanted to get things like motion blur and some of those other effects. So, um, so we also added the vertex sharing, which gave us the ability to do motion vectors. So we could actually do smoothing and motion, and motion blur. And then asset management. I think they had over 300 separate clips in timeline. Each shot is kind of s captured out separately. Um, so we worked with them on some batch processing and some of the other things. Here's an example of one of the timeline shots. Each one of these clip, these red ones is a separate cache clip. Um, and you can see, so here's the, uh, the prophet's head. Or Marion's head, the prophet's head, the Marion's cloth, the prophet's cloth. So they're all synced up and timed out. And then this number is just the shotgun scene for organization. And then on the bottom down here, we've got some of the tarps and background stuff. So um, again, traditional motion capture. The motion capture becomes its own clip. The capture video reference, because uh, again, we're kind of combining all these things. We needed to actually layer it together and have the reference footage. And then they did facial capture using this. It's literally a, like a, an animation motion uh, photogrammetry booth setup. So we've got the, the little gift station downstairs. It's kind of the same idea, except it's capturing the whole head at, at X frame per second. And then we get the vertex streams for each. So these are like the snapshots of each frame of animation that then get baked out through Alembic. Um, cloth as well, we use Marvelous to simulate the cloth initially. Um, but they captured a lot of video reference. They wanted to actually be able to reproduce what the cloth looked like in real life. So they captured the actress moving around and so you can get the, the sense of the, what the cloth looks like. So we could see the subsurface and some of the other things. And then simulating it out with Marvelous. Marvelous we then brought into Maya to do some edge cleanup and some of the other things. And then the, the final result gets combined. Here's a shot of the, uh, the motion capture in sort of the various stages as it goes through. So here we have the, the faces, some of the uh, uh, initial sims, um, being able to try out the different ideas. And then we'll, uh, actually this one's not too bad. Um, some of the early test shots in the engine. And then again, the facial capture and then trying to combine it with the, the, end, the end result rig mesh. Um, being able to play it back, and then this is playing back in the DCC tools, trying to do some scene composition, bring all the elements together. Um, there's a lot of moving parts, especially trying to sync up like the, the cloth and the, the motion capture and then the heads. So then they bring the animation into, into Marvelous to be able to sim it out. Um, and then we get the final result in engine. So it was a uh, and then for, for the mirror in particular, we also did then tessellation on the face in engine to basically up res it so we could do the crazy eye thing. And we had uh, um, some, basically some, I think uh, John Parsi talked about that in another talk to this week, um, being able to do the, the crazy facial animation. Background elements like tarps, again, they're just simulated out and played in, uh, played in timeline. And here's a, a cool shot of just some of the things that you may not even realize are there. You can see the background tarps um, wiggling around and being able to composite them together and put the scenes back together. Again, they're all just being simulated out, going through the DCC tools, and then playing back in timeline. 
So Alembic, there's a preview available in Package Manager on the forum here. Package Manager is our new w uh, method of distributing content, so you can actually access it, um, there, update your manifest, give it a try. Um, it will be a, uh, in full release hopefully shortly. Um, we're trying to basically bring all these different pieces in, into, uh, into Package Manager and it's uh, going to greatly streamline bringing things out. Um, some photogrammetry. Oh, I already had these slides. Let's see, fast forward. Where are we? Did, did I duplicate my slides? I did. Where are we? Yeah, I think that... All right. Let's go from here. I duplicated my slides. These are just a couple quotes from a couple of their artists. Just basically how... Going from a traditional VFX film pipeline to working in a real-time engine, and it a lot of them, they, the, quote, the main quote is that they felt that they were cheating, you know, being able to actually update and see things, being able to do real-time lighting. Um, Jeff was one of the environment artists, being able to actually work on tools and being able to jump in and basically be able to produce re realistic content or that shipped right from day one. Um, another resource, you may have seen this announcement on the Asset Store, we partners with uh, Mega scans. This was seen in the Book of the Dead. Some more photogrammetry, but we partnered with some of these providers to basically make sure that you get the best quality content. So you can literally use the. This is the exact asset pack they use for some of the Book of the Dead content. So you can actually get access to that straight from the from the asset store. And then here's the the link dump. So the FBX exporter again. It's built in. It's in the asset store. I believe it'll be a package as well soon. The scripted importers, if you're looking at implementing or customizing your own import pipeline. Um, ProBuilder and its documentation, the Alembic package. We've got some blog posts as well that we talk about some of the work that we did with Alembic and how that pipeline worked in. And then the very bottom one is the recorder, which is what we use to record gameplay animation, being able to export that out, bring that in. And then uh, it also is a allows you to output video or frames right from Unity as well. So. Most of the videos that we saw from in Unity were actually captured with the recorder, the same as the uh, the final movie output for the Atom pieces was done with the recorder as well. Um, and I think that's that's what I've got for slides. I don't know if you guys, I can show you a couple of these things in the editor. Um, let's see here. So here's the this is the zombie that we talked about um, earlier. But uh, the, the main one I want to show you is where the, uh, for the presets, which is, it's actually this it's kind of hidden little, looks like a double toggle here. But you can just open it up and then basically it takes all of your settings that you have in, your, in the inspector. So, and you can see here we have preserving hierarchy, when you want import lights, cameras, the welding vertices, keep quads that we mentioned. Um, so being able to actually set all this as a format or an import preset, um, and that goes for rig, animation, materials, what all the properties that you want to do, um, being able to actually set that as the default, and then we can, uh, we can just save this as a new, we'll call this FBX default, and then I can find that, and I select it, and if I click set as FBX importer default, whatever I've specified in these properties will be used for any FBX that's loaded in. So if I'm really particular about, I want it to be the, the new 32-bit format, if I've got really high-res uh, meshes, um, I can specify that I want everything to be 32-bit format. Or if I know um, I don't want to weld vertices, or um, see I don't have any blend shapes maybe, um, or some of the compression. One thing that I tend to use this, or one that's really useful for, is file scale. Um, I, uh, this is one of the challenges that we're still working on, is content back and forth. It always ends up being some, it's either 0.001 or 0.1 or something. So you can kind of figure out what that form, what that size is, and then a batch, ap batch apply it. Um, so if I set this as, say, my default, I can go and find some content. I've got some of my mocap here. Um, you can just grab some and then just open it up and hit go and it'll apply that to all those objects, all those, all those animations. Um, I probably broke a whole, another scene, but that's the whole thing. 
Um, but uh, the other thing is, uh, there's a, oh yeah, the part of the presets is you can, uh, there's a preset manager. So in here, you can uh, manage the presets. You can add new presets if you've got um, different ones. Um, so in this case, this is saying that I've got the FBX default. So I could remove that and just select it and remove it. So if you want to add, I can pick a different preset and it shows you your different presets. So you could have a preset for animation, a preset for just static meshes, um, whatever combination of things. And again, there's also different, be you can set up, um, I haven't learned all of the tricks you can do with the presets, but you can set up, so you want to, you have a light preset where you have a specific set, like say you're daylighting, you can actually have that and drag it into the scene view onto a light and it'll actually apply the preset settings then. Um, so it's not just for the, uh, the mesh import. Um, you can, uh, you can apply it in all different ways. Um, let's see. Some of the other things, and this is also where you can see the import cameras, some of the new features we've added, being able to import lights. Um, and then some of the new uh, calculate for being able to, if you're bringing in meshes and you want to calculate, we've done some work on the different uh, cal or calculations or methods for calculating normals. Um, and then there's some new uh, tangent space work being done as well. Um, Let's see, what else? Oh yeah, the new, the new material um, process, uh, workflows. So for materials, we now, we now have this ability of remapping materials. So instead of setting up your material, like you have to drag the object into the scene, set it up as the, all the materials, you can actually um, use the embedded materials or external materials is the legacy where you'd have your materials, you set them all up, apply it in the scene, um, or you can actually remap them here and it'll apply to all the, all the objects as well. Um, so let's find one of my characters. So my characters are using um, pre-mapped materials that I created. Um, we did some look dev and I just apply that. So in this case, it's handy because I don't actually need to make a prefab of that character. I can actually just use it in the scene, um, which is also was useful for doing some of the round tripping. Um, and then if you find an object that isn't exported, so let me find, uh, let's see. Oh, where did I put the Autodesk City stuff? So, uh, so I can find one of these um, that I didn't export. So this one here has got built-in ones. Um, with FBX, you can embed the textures as well into the asset. So by default, we will use all of the materials will appear as embedded in the FBX. Um, the goal here is to basically start getting, uh, deter moving towards being able to do deterministic import. Um, so come on in. Um, so the idea is that that FBX isn't creating a whole bunch of assets in your project. Um, so the material, the textures, all the meshes are all part of that. But if you do want to export it, you can extract the textures, you can extract the materials, um, and then we can just make a material folder. And at that point, it creates the materials and you can modify it and do what you want, do what you need to with it. Um, once you extract them, it'll show you the, the, um, that it's doing this on-demand remap now. Um, oops. So we have our material. And because I'm in scriptable render pipeline, I'm just going to swap over to the other material. Um, and now here, it'll show me that I've, I've, I'm doing on-demand remap for that material. Um, um, yeah. Any questions? No, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, if you triangulate it, it turns into mud when you subdivide Yes, it. I get it. Yeah, awesome. no. I just wanted to uh, use no, I, under, I understand why you want to keep it quad quantified for sure. Um, I just haven't actually 
checked after I exported something if it kept the quads. Um, again, I'm not an I'm not a modeler, so that I'm not usually at that level of detail. But we'll definitely ask the devs and, and look at confirming that. So, um, if we don't have any other questions, uh, that's that's my talk. Um, again, show you go back to the uh, the link slide. Um, the DCC teams on the forum were very active working with this. Um, the Autodesk side is super active. There's some guys in the back if you want to talk to the Autodesk team. Um, we're super excited about the partnership and it's, uh, it's been awesome working with them and being able to make sure that we've got the best tools in the industry for creating and bringing content into the engine. So, awesome. Thank you very much. Sounds like a great idea. <laughs> yeah, I know one of the biggest. Yeah, one of the biggest. One of the biggest requests is uh, we've got IK for the humanoid. We don't have IK for generic. That's obviously a huge, a huge point of uh, interest, um, and it's something I know the team is well aware of, and it's on their roadmap. So, yeah. um, we'll, we'll, it'll be exciting to see where that goes. Um, cool. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Because that's definitely one of the challenges is your, like you get the advanced animation control rigs and some of the other pieces that don't make sense to bring into the game engine. How do we match those two? So this, there's, there's some areas of exploration that we're looking at for sure. Right, so um, you kind of have your arm, you know, stay on the table yeah. in real time. Yeah. You know, you need the IK. Right? Yeah. And I can prove it to you that it works. I mean, not in Unity, but in a prototype uh, I worked on a while ago where we took into my ASCII file directly. We got IK running in a real time engine that's not Unity. <laughs> IK TV solver. So be glad to show the voice back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The an the animation team is super passionate about that kind of thing for sure. So. Yeah. Cool. That was good. Thank you guys. Thank you.